Good morning, church family, friends, and followers online. Let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. Father God, thank you for bringing us through another week. Thank you for your protection, your providence. Thank you for all of the goodness that you have bestowed on us, lavished on us, showered on us this week. Father God, I pray that during this time together that your spirit would break up any stony grounds in our hearts so that the truth of your word might penetrate and produce fruit in us. It's Christ's name we pray in. Amen. Now, of course, last week was Easter, so we talked about the resurrection, but two weeks ago we began this series, G is for Gospel, and today we are rejoining that series. What we're, what we're doing is this. In each lesson, we are telling the story of the Gospel using a word that begins with the letter G. Our scripture for today is Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now, let's, let's apply this real quick in today's world. Of course, in, in Paul's day, the people of God, the people who, who had God's word, the people who had God's law, those were, you know, the Jews, and then the Gentiles was everyone else, right? So if you're thinking about this today, think about this as what he's going to say is applies to church people and not churched people, religious people and irreligious people, saved people and not saved people. Uh, what Paul says here. So both Jews and Greeks, or both church people and not church people, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside, and together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That was a cheerful passage to kick things off with, right? I mean, it says that no one is any good, that no one does any good. We don't even want what's good. Now, that's so far away from where we began a couple of weeks ago, isn't it? Two weeks ago, we talked about what I called the backstory of the gospel, and that was goodness the goodness of God, and the original goodness of creation. When God created everything, when he created our world and the animals and humanity, Genesis 1.31 says that God called it all very good. This world was a very good place, and people were very good people. The Westminster Shorter Confession tells us that the chief end of humanity is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's what God created us for. But look at us now. Look at us now. Where there was goodness, now there is guilt. And that's our word for today. If God's goodness is the prologue to the gospel, then human guilt, my guilt, your guilt, our collective guilt, is the catastrophic disaster that has doomed us all and God's very good world with us. Oh, you can still see glimpses of God's goodness in the world. The heavens still declare the glory of God, and 
the firmament still proclaims his handiwork. The mountains and the hills break into song and the trees of the fields still clap their hands. Like the old hymn says, all nature sings and round me rings. But Cornelius Plantinga writes that now creation speaks out of both sides of its mouth. It still sings and round us rings, but it also groans. Romans 8 tells us that the whole creation has been groaning for release from its bondage to decay. It also says that we humans are groaning for deliverance right along with the rest of the world. Why are we groaning? Why are we groaning? Because we know that underneath it all, underneath all the goodness and glory in this world, hidden beneath the ravishing sunsets and the radiance of the moon and the refreshing summer rains and the sugary citrus scent of magnolias blooming that tickles our noses, beneath all of that, something twisted and depraved is lurking. There is a fatal cancer at the core of the world that sometimes erupts as pandemics and tornadoes, as wildfires and droughts and floods. We watch the evening news, we read the headlines, and we see that this cancer has metastasized through the very fabric of every society in this world. This global sickness unto death presents as war and corruption, as racism and pollution and greed. But many of us, if we are self-aware, we are also acutely aware that this malignancy, this terminal cancer, has also taken root deep in our own hearts, throughout our whole lives, and it just grows and grows as lust, as cruelty, as hatred, as apathy at the suffering of others, as envy, as ungratefulness. We are all dreadfully eat up with it, and there is not a blessed thing we can do to get us out of it or get it out of us. It has spread to every part of us. This sad state of affairs, this sickness unto death, the Bible calls it sin. And there is also a name that names both our moral responsibility for sin and the weight of our despair over our wretchedness and doom. And that word is guilt. We all have it. And the only people who don't feel it are narcissists and sociopaths. And our fatal guilt cries out for the gospel. Because without the gospel, without some good news, we are doomed by our sin and by our guilt both in this life and in eternity. Now, here's what happens with most people. We talk about guilt. And this is why it doesn't really go anywhere. Most everybody feels this vague sense that things are not quite right, along with this uneasy feeling that we somehow bear some personal responsibility for it. And these feelings of personal accountability are often accompanied by a growing sense of dread. For example, back when I was in the third grade, the principal came to our classroom and asked to see me. And then he called me to the front of the class. And of course, I'm having a full-blown anxiety attack, trying to remember what my most recent shenanigans might have been for the principal to come looking for me. And trust me, I was guilty of a lot of shenanigans back then. Now, I was greatly relieved 
to find out that he only wanted to congratulate me in front of the whole class because a drawing I had made had won a contest. I was uh, drawn this picture and it was going to be made into a billboard to advertise a local art festival. You can imagine my relief, right? In my experience, most people have some vague idea that eventually the universe is going to hold them accountable. They're just not sure what for exactly, right? Kind of like me when the principal came in the room. But we all kind of know that one day the way that we have lived is going to catch up with us. One day the principal will find us and this time he will not be coming to pin a ribbon on us and praise us. This time, he's going to drag us to his office, and the paddle's going to come out. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't even know if they do that anymore in Alabama, where I grew up. The paddle's going to come out, and then it's going to be all over but the shouting. This is a subjective sense of guilt. Here's what I mean by that. We can all point to a thousand things we've done that might deserve a cosmic spanking, but not one thing in particular. And this fills people with a kind of unnamed dread or panic or angst. Here's the problem with our subjective sense of guilt. Because there's really only three things we can do with it. And none of them are very helpful. None of them are going to work long term. First, some people wallow in it and let it fester into toxic shame that just paralyzes them. The Bible talks about that, incidentally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, where, where Paul contrasts godly sorrow that can lead us to repentance and salvation. And he contrasts that with worldly sorrow that can only kill us. There is a difference, a big difference between repentance and a pity party. Second, other people try to cover it up by saving the world. They work too much. They try to fix all their friends. They volunteer for everything. They give generously to worthwhile causes. They adopt stray animals. They become hashtag activists and paper their Facebook walls with motivational quotes. And we all hate those people because they make us feel like we are not doing enough and we are not good enough. We don't realize that deep down they don't feel good enough either. They've got this cancer of guilt that is eating up their souls and they are just putting band-aids on it and hoping that no one will notice. Third, then there's the rest of us. We think it over and we decide that, hey, we're pretty good people. I have never murdered anyone. I've never robbed anyone. And after all, if you can't put your finger on one thing that's really wrong, then maybe nothing's wrong. So we chase the guilt out of our minds, and it's fine until it's not again. See, this, this, this subjective guilt is going to kill you if you don't come to grips with it, it's going to kill your spirit with shame or you're going to work yourself to death or you're going to kill your conscience by pretending you're okay when you're totally not okay. And you're not only going to die, but you are actively contributing then to the misery of the world because you're going to be a miserable person and you're going to make other people around you miserable. And this is where the law, God's law, comes in. This is where God's law is helpful. First of all, the law tells us that we are not accountable to just an impersonal universe. We are accountable to a personal God, and we are creatures of a good God, a God who made us in his image and likeness. And this good personal God has revealed his objective standard of righteousness to us in his law. 
And if the creator of the universe has revealed his law to us, now we no longer have to be oppressed by this vague, unnamed, subjective sense of guilt. We now have an objective standard to live by that's been given to us by the good God who created us. You don't have to guess what you should feel guilty about. Now you can know exactly what is expected of you. And here's the best part. God's law only has ten commandments. Just ten? Oh, that should be easy to do, right? Ten simple do's and don'ts. Okay. Okay, let's look at one of them. One that should be pretty easy not to break. Here it is. Deuteronomy 5.17, thou shalt not kill. And you say, great! I've never murdered anyone. I've got this. Hold on. Not so fast. We're not done yet. 1 John 3.15 says that anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. Have you ever hated anyone? Have you ever hated someone so bad that you wished something bad would happen to them? Then 1 John 3.15 says that you're a murderer. You see, God's laws aren't just about what you do or don't do. They're about what goes on in your heart and your mind. There's actually a lot going on with this command against killing. We have barely, and I mean barely, scratched the surface of everything this command requires. I, I could preach a multiple sermon series on this command. I'll just put it like this. This command not to kill means that God expects you to do everything in your power to preserve and protect the lives of others. And if you are an adult of sound mind, you have absolutely violated this command multiple times in multiple ways. Not only that, but these Ten Commandments are kind of an all-or-nothing deal. For instance, James chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that whoever keeps the whole law but fails in just one point has become guilty of all of it. One of these Ten Commandments is honor your father and your mother. You know full well that nobody makes it through their surly teenage years without violating that one pretty regularly. Then there's the Tenth Commandment. The final one that tells you not to covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. How many of you have never envied what somebody else has? You've never begrudged someone else's happiness? or success. Now these Ten Commandments, there are only ten. They don't seem so doable anymore, do they? Lucky for us, Jesus winnowed those Ten Commandments down to just two. He said, look, if you can do just these two things, you have fulfilled the whole law. We can keep just two measly commandments, right? Here are those two commands, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Okay, we can stop right there. We've already admitted to murdering others in our hearts, to not honoring our parents, and to coveting, which means that we have not loved our neighbor as ourself. And let's face it, I do this 
you do this, we do this. We've all put God way down on the list of our priorities. And we have filled our hearts and our minds with a lot of shiny junk that we pay more attention to than we do God. So much for loving him with all our heart and soul and mind. Ah, but maybe, maybe there's still hope for us. I, I just remembered somewhere where Jesus boiled down the entire law to just one command. Surely we can obey one command. That one command that Jesus said fulfills the whole law. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. The famous golden rule, as we call it, whatever you wish others would do to you. Do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. <sighs> I suck at that one too. I mean, Jesus basically says here, don't be a jerk, be thoughtful, be patient, put yourself in someone else's shoes and be as gentle with them as you'd hope they would be with you, and I fail at that I mean, Jesus hung the whole law of God on this really low peg. I'm talking at the level of Mr. Rogers talking to three-year-olds. And I've still found a way to botch this one every day of my life. And this is the crushing weight of our guilt. Guilt that is not just a subjective sense that things are not quite right. No. We are objectively guilty of violating the good commands of God. We can't even keep one law. Forget ten of them. What on earth is wrong with us? How did we go from God looking at us, God looking at his world, and saying this is all very good, to now what we heard in Romans 3, that none of us does anything good, no, not even one of us, and we can't even obey one of God's laws. No, not even one. Do you see how far we have fallen? Me, you, every last miserable one of us. Romans 3.23 is the famous verse that says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's what I think that most people, and I'm talking most church people too, do with this passage. Because I know this is what I did with it for a long time. And I, and I watch, I observe, I listen. I think we use this passage to excuse our sins. To feel better about ourselves. To justify ourselves. After all, if everyone's a sinner, why, you're no better than me, I'm no better than you, and don't you dare judge me, because you are a sinner just like I am. We use this verse to dull the edges of our guilt and honestly to minimize our own sin. It's almost like we want this verse to mean God is so good, so if we've all flunked the test, why, he's just going to have to lower his standards. We will gladly admit that we are sinners, but here's what we really mean by that. We mean, I admit that I've made some mistakes. I've got shortcomings just like everyone else. I've done some things I'm not proud of. That's our self-talk. And that's the story we project in front of others. We act like we accidentally stepped on a Lego of sin and now we have a sore foot. But that's not the story the Bible tells. The Bible says that our very first human ancestor, Adam, willfully dove headfirst into the shallow end of the pool of sin and broke his neck. And since that day, all humanity has been laying paralyzed 
on the floor of the pool, drowning as we are pulled along to the deep end. There is a name for our pathetic condition, helpless and dying and completely unable to save ourselves, and it's called total depravity. Oh, but how we protest and complain when we hear this phrase. I mean, isn't depraved a strong word? I mean, I know I'm a sinner. We're all sinners, but I'm not depraved. That's just gross. But what else would you call somebody who can't even obey one law? When we talk about total depravity, we don't mean that every person is as wicked as they could possibly be. I mean, everyone is not Hitler, right? Everyone is not Ted Bundy. I mean, just observing the world shows us that not everyone is as wicked as we could possibly be. Here's what this phrase total depravity means. A couple of things. First, it's total in the sense that no one is exempt from it. The entire human race is sunk. No one is righteous, no not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no person, there is no family, there is no race or nation that is born with good genes that somehow help them to avoid lust or pride or hatred. Not one. We are all prone to these sins from birth. Yes, from birth. Think about this, parents. Did you have to teach your children to disobey? <laughs> you don't have to teach your child to disobey. I've got a 10-month-old, and I've got that one figured out. You don't have to teach them how to be selfish or willful or careless. You have to train them to obey, to share, to yield, and to be thankful. R.C. Sproul said that we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Second, total depravity is total because every part of us is somehow corrupted by sin. Body, soul, and spirit, our hearts, our minds, and our wills, there is not any part of us that can stand up to scrutiny. There is nothing that we have done. There is no intention we have ever had. There is nothing in us that can stand before God and say, I am worthy of eternal life with you. There is nothing in us that can stand before God and say, I am worthy of the sunsets that I have seen and the food I have eaten and the air that I breathe. You cannot even say to God, well, at least my heart was in the right place. According to God, your heart has never been in the right place. Genesis 8.21, God says that every inclination of our heart is evil from childhood. And Jeremiah 17 verse 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Your heart, my heart, our collective hearts have never been in the right place. Even when we are on our best behavior, we are still hopelessly corrupt. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says that even all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Why? Because even when we're out doing good deeds, our motives are always mixed. I know that is offensive, but look deep and you'll see it. There's no altruism. There's always pride or selfishness, trying to gain power over someone or something, trying to prove our own worth mixed in with the good that we are doing. And what is God supposed to do about this? How should God respond? Here's another phrase we don't like. 
the wrath of God. This does not mean that God gets angry like we get angry. There's nothing arbitrary or petty about it. God doesn't fly off the handle. The wrath of God does not mean that God is like a mean drunk, abusive, prone to unpredictable tempers, so he's going to come home and beat his kids. But what do we expect God to do? Should he lower his standards? We're talking about the Ten Commandments here. Should God be okay with, I don't know, like a little bit of idolatry? A little bit of adultery? A little bit of murder and violence and mayhem? After all, after all, we're only human. How would we expect God to respond? He created us to care for his creation and to protect it. He created us to serve and to protect each other. But he looks down and we are destroying each other. We are destroying ourselves. We're dumping garbage in the oceans, which, by the way, that's God's aquarium. We are totally vandalizing his world. And what? We don't think God should be angry about it? We think what? God should relax? He should lighten up? Lower his standards? Cut us some slack? Let me put it to you this way. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture that describes the wrath of God is Hosea 13, verse 8. God says, like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. God's wrath is the fierce, protective love of a mama bear if you attack her babies. Now, parents, we know, we know this fierce, protective love. If a bad guy broke into your home in the middle of the night making eyes at your kids, what, you're just going to cut him some slack? If God didn't have wrath, it would mean that he didn't care. It would mean that he doesn't really love his people and he doesn't really love his world. But that's where we're stuck. Between our guilt and God's wrath. Scripture says, Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, which is awful enough, but eternal separation from God, outer darkness, away from everything that brings us joy and pleasure, in solitary confinement, with no hope of escape, Scripture says that our God is a consuming fire, and the law is no help. We haven't lived by it. We can't obey it. It's helpful in that it takes us away from that subjective, kind of vague sense of angst and actually shows us what we should feel bad about. But it's not helpful out of getting us out of this mess. Romans 3.20, in fact, tells us that he says that no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. When we hear those Ten Commandments, all we find out is that we've already broken them. And we routinely break them. The law reveals just how guilty we are. It will not justify it will us. It will not justify us. It will only justify God's wrath. The law seals our doom. The law is like a mirror that we look into and we see the truth about ourselves and we see the truth about our sins. You can look into a mirror, right? And see that you got something in your teeth. 
but you can't pull the mirror down off the wall and floss your teeth with it. We are totally depraved. We are all guilty. None of us is righteous. None of us does what's good. We're so blinded and deceived by our sin and our depravity that not one of us would turn to God on our own because our sin won't even let us see that we need God. That's why without the law, we are just sort of feeling guilty about a thousand things and maybe a lot of those we don't need to feel guilty about and we're not feeling guilty about the things that we ought to. God is good. And because God is good, He will not, He cannot, He relax His standards. He will not and cannot just cut us some slack because we are rebels, we have vandalized His world, and we don't even care most of the time. But God is good. And that means He also won't just Leave us all to suffer and die and rot in our guilt. This is why God became human. This is why the eternal Son of God became flesh and dwelled among us. This is the whole reason for Jesus. So that we would no longer be caught between our guilt and God's wrath. Listen to God's goodness. Listen to Romans 8, 3 through 4, and hear the gospel. Here's some good news. It says, For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do. The problem has never been with God's law. Psalm 19 says that the law of the Lord is perfect. It says that the law was what weakened by flesh problem is us. We are sinners and we cannot keep it. We did that to ourselves. We chose that. God did not choose it for us, but God did choose to make a way out. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. The Son of God became human, became one of us, freely chose to stand for all of us, and he became a sin offering for all of God's people. He suffered the wrath of God. He suffered both the consequences of sinners and the injustice of sin's victims. He was treated like God's enemy so that we rebels, God's true enemies, could be reconciled to God. Just like Adam plunged us all into sin and death, Jesus has unleashed a flood of forgiveness and life on us. Why did it have to be that way? Jesus came and lived and died among us and for us in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. God never relaxed his requirements. In fact, Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Jesus came and he lived perfectly obedient to God's law. And now, when you are united to Christ in faith, His perfect obedience is applied to your life. When God looks at you, if you are in Christ, He sees Christ. He sees His own beloved son or daughter, the son of God became a human so that sinful, rebellious humans could be made sons and daughters of God. This is the gospel. This is the good news. That we are guilty, but God is good. We're going to talk more about that next time. 
when we look at grace. But today, today may this gospel penetrate our hearts that we are guilty, but God is good.